Hi, this is David Scherer, and I'm here for Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. Um, we just uh, finished uh, an exam, and we're going to move on to uh, topics related to um, radiation shielding and, and things that, that are directly related to, to radio health physics. Now, someone, just before I turn on the video, someone asked whether it's... Um, It'd be uh, possible to go over some of the questions on the exam uh, when, once you get your solutions, and I'm going to give my answer on the recording for everybody's benefit. I'm available to talk to you about health physics and about the course before the exam, after the exam, before the homework's turned in, after the homework's turned in, whatever you want to do to talk to me about uh, going over um, uh, health physics, uh, that would be great with me. Um, we don't have a, enough opportunity to do enough example problems and do enough calculations. So I understand this can be very confusing for people. I would uh, uh, love to have those people who find it difficult to reach out and I will spend all the time we need to make you comfortable with understanding how we set up problems, how we uh, go about doing the problems, uh, what assumptions are, are reasonable to make, et cetera. So I think that would be really good for people to um, find time. Now, I understand that this is a, a program for working people and people have jobs, people have families, and, and nobody has enough time. But um, the limitation is not because of me. Reach out and I will make time for any of you. So uh, that said, I'm going to try to get the slides set up and share the screen with that. And then we can uh, go on from here. Um, let me see if I can move this. I, I can't move it around. There we go. Yeah, oh, that's the one I want. I apologize for the uh, I don't know the time it takes to set this up. Um, I've got a new setup with, with my monitors. and So let me share my screen. And this is what we're going to talk about. So I assume you all can see my screen now. And we're going to talk about radiation shielding. Um, and there's a lot to cover here, but we're going to get through it. Uh, so, okay. Now, um, so radiation shielding, the basic idea is relatively straightforward, I think. Uh, you have some radiation source, you have some composition of material, and you have a person or something you want to protect. And so, there are three ways to protect ourselves from uh, uh, external radiation, time, distance, and shielding. Limit the amount of time we're in a radiation field. We limit the radiation dose. Increase the distance, and from a diverging radiation source, like a point source, we lower the radiation exposure. And shielding is the third method, adding material between us and the source so that it absorbs the energy instead of uh, our bodies absorbing the energy, or whatever you want to protect. Now, charged particles, uh, as we learned before, are um, uh, have uh, uh, charged particles have a definite range of material. So, if we're trying to shield ourselves from charged particles, it's at least in principle possible to have sufficient material that we can attenuate all the charged particle radiation, beta particles, alpha particles. Uh, any of uh, protons, pions, whatever. Um, now, if that's impractical for some reason, we can reduce the the um, amount of radi uh, the, uh, the the energy that the charged particles will have as they pass through. They deposit uh, a set amount of energy per unit distance traveled, and so the, the the particles that are emerging after the shielding will have reduced energy and therefore reduced dose. Okay. Um, and this is very similar. The, 
penetrating power, different radiations. We're, we're going to focus on photon radiation in this uh, uh, lecture because that's the most complicated thing to shield. So we learned before how to look up what the range of particle, uh, uh, range of uh, charged particle is in, mater in different materials. It was a NIST website, so we can use that information to to use to develop shielding for charged particles. Um, we can't. There is no fixed range for photons. We reduce the number of photons, uh, as you're going to see, um, but we can't completely eliminate them. So it's, there's a balancing act to be uh, uh, had, um, and so it's going to be some dense material of some thickness. And here is the formula. We're going to start off with a simple problem. And that is we have a, a photon beam that's a parallel photon beam uh, uh, that we need to reduce. And so we're going to reduce it with some thickness of material. The equation for uh, a photon beam is just this. The intensity that occur, uh, comes out at the exit side of the, the um, uh, material is equal to the incident photon uh, energy or uh, intensity and e to the minus mu x. x is the thickness of the material. Mu is the attenuation coefficient. Now, remember before, we had the attenuation coefficient, linear attenuation coefficient, and we had the energy absorption coefficient. This is the attenuation coefficient. We're not that interested in how much energy is being deposited in the material. We want to know how much the material is removed from the beam, how, uh, material, how much, how many, much of the photon beam is removed. And so we use the attenuation coefficient for shielding. Let's see. So that's the basic formula. And here's the geometry. We have some incident beam. We have a parallel beam of photons from some large source. And then the amount of uh, intensity of, of photons on the outward side exiting the, 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 the shielding material will be reduced more and more based on the uh, thick, thickness of the material, the amount of material present. It's e to the minus mu x. And this formula is set up with flux. Remember, flux is the number of particles per square centimeter per second. It's a parallel beam. It's just um, so it's not reduced, uh, decreasing. It's just staying the same. And then um, the flux on the other side is is just like I said, e to the minus mu x. For dose, it's very similar. The dose rate coming out of the beam at the shielded dose rate is the unshielded dose rate times e to the minus mu x also. Mu is attenuation coefficient. That's just a fraction of, of photons being removed per unit path length, path length. Okay, so far so good? Straightforward? Good. There's another way to set up the problem. Instead of using the attenuation coefficient, we, it's very common to use a concept called the half value layer to do shielding problems. The half value layer or half value thickness is the amount of material that will reduce the beam by half. Um, uh, now the HVL, just like attenuation coefficient, uh, depends on the energy of the photons. Remember, high energy uh, photons had a different attenuation coefficient than low energy uh, photons for almost every material. Um, uh, and, and so it depends on the energy, depends on the material, and it, the half a layer is expressed in thickness, millimeters, centimeters, inches, some unit of thickness. How are the two HVL and attenuation coefficient related? So if X is, we'll call the half value, half value layer of thickness X, okay, then here's our formula, I is equal to I zero e to the minus mu X. Well, the thickness is, is cutting the beam in half. So I is a half of I zero, E to the minus mu X. So if we uh, do a little bit of algebra, put the, the one half on one side, take the logarithms of both sides um, and, and invert them, then um, the half A layer is the natural log of two divided by the attenuation coefficient. That's the relationship between the two. It's a pretty straightforward thing. So here's an example problem of doing a problem with half a layer. Instead of e to the minus mu x, we just look at powers of two. So we have a source that's 32 MR per hour, and we need to reduce it to 2 MR per hour. 
that means we need to reduce it by 32 over 2. We need to reduce it by a factor of 16. How many powers of 2 are needed to uh, reach a, a, a 16, a, a attenuation of factor of 16? Well, 2, 4, 8, 16. So it's four half value layers. Oops. I'm going to move my camera a little bit so I can see the bottom of the slide. So for this material, I went and looked up the half value layer of the gamma radiation from iodine 131. It's 0.178 centimeters of material. That's the half value layer. We need four of those. So we need a total of 0.71 uh, centimeters. This is pretty easy to do compared to, to the uh, attenuation coefficient. We don't have to do any exponentials or logarithms, just figure out how many powers of two we need. So that's a straightforward way to do a shielding problem. So here are some examples of the data that's out there. And I'll talk, we'll talk about sources of data in a bit, but there are, um, these are examples of the half a layer in millimeters and inches for some photon, some, some gamma sources for different kinds of material. I don't need to read them to you. You can look them over, but you can see that the for different materials, it, it, it's quite variable. But there are a reasonable amount of material depending on, you know, for each half value layer. Concrete is a common shielding material because it's cheap. Uh, lead and uranium are and tungsten are all common shielding materials because they're thick and attenuate quite a bit. You can see that... Uh, uh, about a tenth of the amount of material or so of um, uh, lead is required for the same attenuation for of iridium. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's quite uh, the, the density of the material and atomic number really um, has a big factor on, on the HVL. Sometimes HVL data is available to you, so you should know how to use it. Um, uh, and here are some examples on the bottom of the slide showing half A layers for X-ray sources. Remember, X-ray sources do not have a single photon energy, so it's a little bit more complicated to get the HVL, but um, uh, there's no mu, but from uh, direct measurements, you can see what the half A layer is. Any questions so far? Great. So another concept that's very similar is the 10th value layer. There are also tables available with the 10th value layer of uh, different materials at different energies. Um, and so any guesses what a 10th value layer is? It's the amount of material you need to cut the, the exposure by a, a factor of 10. And so if you've got a fact, uh, uh, you know, it's relatively easy to, to, to um, look at a dose rate and know what dose rate I want to get to and, and see how many orders of magnitude, how many factors of 10 I need to reduce it. And then it's straightforward to estimate the amount of uh, material is needed. Very easy uh, way to solve a problem. Now, it could never be that easy though, right? It's gotta be more complicated. And in our case, the complication comes in with scatter radiation. So if we have a good geometry situation that's shown on the top and the um, the photons are highly collimated, then the scatter radiation don't ma doesn't matter to us. We're not adding in any, any dose back to the... the um, uh, so if we have a radiation source and we have a point where we're interested in the radiation dose, then on the, with good geometry, the scatter radiation doesn't uh, uh, add dose to the point that we're interested in. Only the, 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 the photons that are traveling on the main path reach our point of interest where we want to measure the dose, where we want to estimate the dose. This is called good geometry uh, it's because it's very easy to calculate. In this case, under good geometry conditions, then the exponential formula we talked about a minute ago works. Any radiation that is scattered is removed from the primary beam. And so the dose that's received at that point will be reflected by the attenuation coefficient, e to the minus mu x. On the bottom, we have broad beam or bad geometry. Under this circumstance, radiation reaches many different places on the absorber. And some of those uh, 
the scatter photons from parts of the absorber reach the, the point we're interested in. So they'll, they pass along. Uh, uh, the, the ones that, that pass straight through to the detector are, are well characterized by E minus mu x. But in addition to those, there are other photons that are uh, added to that point because of scattered away from the primary beam or from the, the direct path. Is, does this picture make that clear or do I need to describe it better? Okay. Um, so um, in this case, e to the minus mu x won't necessarily tell us what the dose will be at the point uh, we're interested in because of all the additions from scatter. And so, and here's another picture showing that under good beam, narrow beam conditions, good geometry, uh, e to the minus mu x works. If we have broad beam geometry, we have a, a, a broad photon beam, some of the radiation is scattered to the point we're interested in. There's an additional factor that's added in to account for the, the extra radiation due to scatter. It's called a buildup factor. So the added dose due to scatter to the, the, the point of interest is called the buildup factor. Um, the buildup factor, as I just said a minute ago, is, is a factor that multiplies what we would have had without any scatter. That's the V to the mu x. Um, it's the fractional increase in dose because of scatter away from, that occurs apart from the primary beam. Um, it, and so the amount of scatter we can expect is a function of a few things. The energy of the, the uh, photons makes a difference. If these are low energy photons, what's the primary interaction for low energy photons? Don't all speak at once. Photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect. And on the photoelectric effect, essentially all the photon energy abs absorbed, very little of it will, will scatter. At higher energies, we have a lot more Compton effect, right? And so that's where scatter occurs and where it uh, contributes. And then the same thing for pair production. So um, the other thing that, that affects it is material. The kind of material we use, just like we had before, the amount of uh, attenuation is, is uh, dependent on what the atomic number is. The amount of scatter is also dependent on the atomic number. As far as thickness goes, it turns out that the, the way we parameterize thickness, uh, I think this is on the next slide, well, one of the slides, is the, the attenuation coefficient times the thickness. That's called the number of mean free paths. So um, it, that, that combination will, will tell us what the uh, buildup factor will be. So here's another graph showing us uh, what buildup is. So the, the curve that's on the left side, this is a, a log, a semi-log plot. Curve on the left side are the photons that pass through without being collided. The one, but the, the uh, radiation that's observed is a higher radiation dose than that. It's the, the graph on the top to the right. This is, includes the scatter radiation and the added uh, rate dose at some point is a buildup factor, whatever multiplication. In this case, it looks like the buildup factor is somewhere around two. It, the, the actual response is about twice as big as the, um, uh, the what we would expect from uncollided photons. Okay. Now, just as uh, John told us, when we have very low energy photons and the photoelectric effect dominates, then the, the buildup factor is essentially one. Uh, at higher energies, Compton effect or pair production, there will be secondary photons from those interactions and the buildup factor um, will be greater. The buildup factor is based on the number of mean free paths, as I said, and uh, it changes, it's di different for values of Z. With higher Z, um, the buildup factor tends to increase more with energy. Okay. But there's uh, more photoelectric effect at low energy for higher atomic number. Yes, sir. When you're talking about good geometry, that doesn't necessarily, and collimation, you're, that doesn't necessarily have to do with image formation. Nope. At all. It's well, like, it, it does, but it does, we're not doing a, so 
in image formation for medical imaging, scatter makes a difference there too. Scatter, good geometry, bad geometry. Uh, scatter makes a difference because um, when you have uh, a lot of scatter, it tends to make the contrast, the dark and the light in the image, uh, uh, decrease. Okay. Yeah. So the scatter sort of washes out the, the picture you would otherwise see. Um, but when you when you say it's collimated, you're talking from the perspective like the machine has collimators. Yeah. What, what I'm like, talking about. Not like you tune them finely. What I talk about in this case, when we're talking about high collimation, yeah. we're talking about pencil beam. So even if you have a, a, an image size, a, a field, a radiation field that's um, 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters, that's not a very big x-ray field, but it will still add scatter. So when I'm talking about well collimated good geometry for this purpose, it's, it's um, you know, centimeter by centimeter, something very small, millimeters. That way, all the scatter that occurs moves out away from the, the, the beam. No incident photon um, uh, reaches the absorber and then is directed toward the, um, the detector. It's all passing straight through. Does that help? So for a typical diagnostic mm -hmm. image x-ray, you would consider that good geometry or broad? That's bad geometry. That's bad geometry. geometry. Okay. That, that's bad. It, this idea of good geometry might be used in a counting lab situation. Oh, okay. But it's not something that we, we it, it's, I, I, we use it more, I'm using it more, to explain the idea of what buildup is and why e, e, why does e, e to the minus mu x even exist? Well, right. it accurately describes the, the, the narrow pencil of, of beam that's passing through and not adding in scatter. It's, it's more for, for the purpose of, of, of explaining the idea than a, a practical situation. Most okay. situations that we encounter are broad beam situations. Okay, yes, Richard. Sorry, I had to find the unmute. No. Um, I, I understand that there may be some conditions where additional radiation can be created through, through certain attenuation or, or certain sources that will attenuate a beam. And I wanted, the question is, is that what we're talking about here? Or are we talking about radiation being deflected and its direction being? Right. Changed? So we're talking about photons. So new radiation being created is often due to like neutrons. What we're really talking about now are secondary photons that are due to Compton scattering or something like that. So photons, the, the, the photons are being redirected toward the area we're interested in. And so that our uh, e to the minus mu x ideal situation doesn't apply because added radiation is being uh, uh, directed toward our point of interest. Does that make it clear or do I need, or, or am I still um, obfuscating for you? Well, so in, in this case, are, are we talking about the additional radiation, um, like from um, uh, from the Compton effect? Right. Okay, Com so. The Compton, uh, uh, the x-rays, the, the, the photons that went out to the edge of the x-ray, of the absorber of our shield, are then adding to the point we're interested in. They're, they're scattering, and some of them are going toward our our detector, not all of them, but some of them are going toward our, our point of interest. And so they're adding up in addition to what's passing straight through. Still? Okay. So if, so if it helps, um, this like used to be explained to me like a bouncy ball. So basically you're not losing any of your bouncy balls. You're not creating any new bouncy balls. They're just moving in a different direction. Yeah. And then when it moves into a different direction, if you put your basket, you know, somewhere and you throw a bunch of bouncy balls, you know, a random amount of bouncy balls could come back. If that makes sense when you're dealing with broad spectrums. It, it, it does. And, and that's the dis distinction I want to make. So we're just talking about something being scattered. In other words, it, right. it goes in one direction and then it's being right. redirected and, and that can affect where our detect by it. The reason uh, we have to talk about it is not unexpected this would happen, right? This all seems very straightforward. Of course, we're going to have scattered radiation, right? 
The reason it's a problem is e to the minus mu x, that calculation is with everything that gets touched is eliminated, right? So e to the minus mu x is, if there was a Compton inter interaction, e to the minus mu x says it's out of the beam. We, we, we count that out. Does that make sense to you, Richard? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm good at this point. Yeah, okay. So we're at, we're at to add back in the ones that got redirected. Okay. Um, uh, here's the example, the slide I was at where the buildup factor is just, we have more radiation because of the scatter that, that um, the calculation didn't include when they defined mu. The buildup factor occurs, um, uh, like I said, mostly in the Compton effect and some pair production. Uh, so how do you get these uh, buildup factors? The, they, are, they exist in tables. You go, go up and you look up a table. Now, here's what the, the formula that they're talking about. The B is the increase over e to the minus mu x, right? Um, this, uh, so for a given material we're interested in, aluminum, say, and we have, you know, uh, two MeV photons. If we go one mu x, that's how thick our shield is, one times mu x. Then we have to add in a, a, uh, an additional buildup factor of, did I say three? Right? I think I said three MeV photons. It's 1.64. So I'm just showing you, showing you how to look up a table. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You have to know what material you're working with. You have to know how many relaxations and thickness you want it. You know, you went and calculated the first time. You did your calculation with e to the minus mu x. And we say, oh, I got to add in my buildup factor that, you know, we need more. Uh, well, we're going to have more radiation. How much more radiation will we have? And it's the multi we multiply by this buildup factor. Okay. So far, so clear, everybody. Now, there are buildup factors for point sources, right? This is the example for point sources. There are other table for parallel beam. We started off with a parallel beam. So the, 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 yes, John. Uh, is it like if you had something in between these numbers, is it like a linear interpolation between yep. those? Okay. A linear interpolation is going to get what we need. I don't think these are linear functions, but I don't think it will matter. For purposes of shielding, we just need to, to uh, uh, get a shielding that's going to be thick enough to attenuate the, what we need. And we'll this will we'll, we'll do it, and we always throw in a little bit of extra thickness uh, for Alara, right? We, you know, if we figure out it's you know, um, you safety know, factor. pardon me, safety factor like engineering. Yeah, safety factor. But I was going to go the way. Sometimes the way you choose the safety factor is, you know, suppose I calculate I'm going to use concrete blocks, and I calculate I need seven inches of concrete. Well, concrete blo blocks come in eight inch blocks. They don't come in seven inch blocks. So you, it, for economic reasons, for construction reasons, it's easier to move up to the next standard thickness that you can buy. And if, you, if it's something like poured concrete where you're, you, you can pick any thickness you want because you're gonna pour the concrete, then you add it in as a safety factor. Those are sort of the practical ways we go about uh, uh, solving these problems. So for example, when you use lead to shield an x-ray room. Um, you can, whatever you calculate for the shielding of lead, uh, a 16th inch of lead, which is four pounds per square feet, anything thinner than that is not self-supporting. The, the, the lead is very pliable, very malleable. If you put a nail through a sheet of lead and it's thinner than a 16th of an inch, it will pull on the nail and create a hole. It's just not thick enough. So when building uh, an x-ray, shielding an x-ray room, it's very common to specify a 16th of an inch, even if you don't need that much thickness, because it's much easier to construct. And so you save money on the construction because of that. That's an example of, of the kind of practical application. Okay, where did I get those tables from? I got them from this book. Anybody seen this before? Never. When I started in this field, everybody had a copy of this. It's called the Rad Health Handbook. It was published by 
of the Food and Drug Administration in 1970. And everybody has a copy on the desk. And I've got one on my desk, on my bookshelf over there. Um, this is still available on the web. It's got a lot of useful information compiled. Um, and a lot of it doesn't change by much. I mean, uh, decay uh, parameters haven't really changed. You know, the energies of decays, half-lives, those data haven't changed. Build-up factors haven't pretty much have, pretty much have not changed since 1970. So it's it's a good source. Um, these are build-up factors from that same source for a monodirectional beam. So you can see there are different tables depending on what you're doing. You, you can, if you think about it for a minute, you can see why a curved surface or a curved uh, a dose profile would give a different build-up factor than a, a, a parallel beam just thinking about the paths that the photons have to take. Um, and here's an example of the same kind of material. It's not a um, buildup factor, but these are attenuation curves, also from the Rad Health Handbook, for different photons. That, and the, the curve represents the hardening of the beam because uh, low-energy photons were removed. Okay. And in addition to... Uh, different buildup factors existing based on uh, the different geometries, whether it's plane beam or whatever. There are buildup factors that are for flux. There are buildup factors that are for energy fluence, E times the flux. Buildup factors that are for dose, which is mu over rho, E times phi. And there are um, buildup factors if you use the energy absorption coefficient. They're all different because the physics is different. You have to pick the correct buildup factor for the problem you're solving. Okay, questions? Okay, here's an, another example of a table with buildup factors. This is for water. These are the relaxation lengths here across, actually I think the energy is across the top. So different photon energies, different relaxation lengths on the left side. And then the buildup factors, um, you can see that for one MeV photons with a really thick material, 30 relaxation lengths. If you didn't use the buildup factor, you would underestimate the, the dose by a factor of 100. So that can be significant. Okay, uh, this is an example for, for lead. Now, I want to move on to a different kind of shielding problem. What we talked about before is a shielding problem for a parallel beam of photons, right? And for a parallel beam of photons, it's e to the, the dose is e to the minus mu x times the, the uh, incident dose. And if we add in a buildup factor, it's b e to the minus mu x. What if we have a point source? That's our next step. So we will go from parallel to a point source. Well, in that case, energy is, uh, the, the dose is reducing by distance by the one over R squared factor, right? That we learned about with fluence. So in this case, the dose for at some point based on shielding is, uh, the, the prime is supposed to represent a rate. So this is the dose rate, is the initial dose rate at some given distance, that's D zero, e to the minus mu x, r0 over r squared. r0 is whatever distance we measured the dose at originally, and r squared is now the, the distance from the point source that we want to get to uh, calculate the dose at. It's all pretty clear to everybody? Okay, so the next kind is a little bit more complicated. It's a line source. So if we think about the line source, as a whole bunch of point sources. Each little point source has activity of the activity divided by the length of the whole thing, right? So many microcuries per centimeter. And we add up all the, the contribution from all the little line sources. Then our dose is the activity. Well, use the one at the bottom. This is straightforward. This is calculating it all from the energy fluence we talked about before. And this is with the dose. If we use the, so we remember we kept, we, we, before we talked talk about the gamma factor, which is how many, um, how much dose 
at a specified distance per unit activity, right? If it's one mega becquerel, then the gamma factor might be how many uh, microgray per mega becquerel at a meter, right? Is that clear? Then uh, the dose from a line source is the gamma factor times what our activity divided by the reference activity. If it was per mega becquerel and we have 10 mega becquerel, then we it, it scales up divided by the length of this of the source times the angles that uh, the total angle that we experience viewing the 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 object at our point of interest divided by our distance so how do we get these angles so if we know that there's we know the length of our source and we are you know 10 units of length along the distance and the the distance we are away from the source is five units of length it's h then this the tangent of our angle is going to be the rise over the run h over however long we have is that clear or am i confusing people okay um about this point in a different class someone asked me could you give us some resources to remind us what a tangent is and transcendental functions it, it, you know everybody has a different level of comfort the point I, is go ahead i have a question if i can jump in go for it so i, I understand the geometry um my question is is what is the can you give me an example of uh, a line a source and no, a physical application of, yep. of how this would exist. Yep, I will do that. And I've got an example problem right here. Okay. Oh, sorry to steal your thunder. That, that's okay. My thunder is still intact, but uh, I, I don't. I don't think the slab source is confusing. I don't think the point source is confusing. So I, I did a line source. Okay, um, as an example. So we got this gamma factor. So all the stuff. So I've noticed in some of the homework problems. People are calculating activities and calculating exposure rates from from uh, uh, first principles. If you uh, you've got a table of gamma factors, uh, you've got tables with specific activities. You don't really have to calculate those directly. Uh, we did that basically so you'd understand the science behind it. But it's perfectly okay to use for the rest of your lives. You're going to look up gamma factors. You're not going to calculate gamma factors using these formulas. So it's okay to look look up gamma factors. I gave you a table with, I don't know, probably a couple hundred gamma factors for different isotopes in it. Uh, you can use that. There are lots of good sources, of, uh, reputable sources with, with the gamma constants um, or specific activities. So if you know how much material you have, you know, you have 10 grams of something, you don't have to calculate it all with the, the lambdas and the Avogadro's number it's okay to go look up what the specific activity is and, and use it that way. Um, anyway, the formula, it turns out, is this angle, right? You multiply this angle divided by the length you are away from the, the line source. And this is the length, this is the activity per unit length of the source. It's the activity, activity divided by the length of the source times the gamma constant. This, remember, the A0 is just our normalization constant that was used to create the gamma factor, the gamma constant. OK, I did a couple of plots to show you what the line source dose profile looks like as a unit of length. So if you have a, um, a very, um, if you're very close, the distance divided by the, the length of the line source is very small. Then this, this formula, the angle divided by H is um, much uh, less than what you'd have for a point source. So when you're very close, an extended source is a low, always a lower dose profile than the, the, the point source would be at the same distance. And when you're very far away, a um the line source relative to the length of the line source the, the line source essentially becomes the same 
as a point source. Okay. So these it's comforting that these two points are, are make sense. Okay. Now here's a problem that we were going to do. It, the problem we have, uh, this is just the problem we're going to do is we have cobalt 60 activation products in a pipe. So you're we're in a um uh a plant that has a, that works with cobalt 60. Maybe it's a power plant and the coolant has a bunch of cobalt 60 in it. The pipe is 10 meters long. And we're inter and the pipe contains one curie per meter of of uh, pipe length. That's what's flowing through this pipe. Uh, and the pipe is five meters above the floor, and we want to know the dose rate at the floor level. Okay. And I looked up what the gamma constant is for cobalt sixty, and here it is. Okay. So this is an example of a line source. We have a 10 meter long line source and we're five meters away from it. Does that help Peter, uh, Richard, in terms of a practical problem? Uh, yes. Uh, this okay. That's an example of uh, uh, where the idealized situation is adequately re represented in real life. Another example might be if we had a radiation source that was shaped like a pencil. And those actually exist, for example, in gamma radiators. Um, so you have to look for a situation. You would use this formula in a situation where you have a long and thin radiation source. Okay, so what I did for this problem is uh, the pipe is wrapped in concrete. It's surrounded by concrete in 30 centimeters. So here's our situation. We have 30 centimeters of concrete around our pipe. So 30 centimeters is about a foot. Okay. The, the pipe is 10 meters long, and we're standing five meters away from it, okay? So what is, the, how do we solve this problem? Um, first thing we have to do is figure out our angle. Well, I chose 10 and five feet because that means that the pipe to the right and the pipe to the left form 90, uh, 45 degree angles. Does that make sense? So if I have the same distance across and distance down, that's a 45 degree angle. The other side is also a 45 degree angle. So I have a total angle of 90 degrees, which is pi over two. Calculate what the dose rate is uh, using our formula right here. Uh, and it's, um, we looked up the, the, the information oh that's uh, yeah here it is uh the dose rate is that's our dose constant this is what the activity is that's pi over two is the angle five feet is the l those are all the things that went into my formula dose rate constant the angle uh the activity uh times the the, the dose rate constant divided by the length that's dose per unit length and the h is a distance away is is five meters so that's all that goes into this um and so i solved it um so um yeah what, what, what i don't remember what i did here e to the minus 4.18 is oh that's because the um the thickness is 30 centimeters what we, we have it here somewhere yeah the the, the mu times the mu over rho times rho is uh, times the, the thickness is 4.18 mean free paths. Okay, that's how far we is. So e to the minus mu r is this. Um, so that's d e to the minus mu r would be this. So I had to go look up for mu r is 4.18. I go look up what the buildup factor is. Remember, I'm one of those tables, point source table. I come back and use it. And then what the dose rate would be, including the buildup factor, including e to the minus mu x, and including this, the factor, because this is a line source, I came up with 0.3 millisieverts per hour. Okay? I didn't do all the math in front of you. I have it typed out. But I hope you'll be able to work that problem by yourself and contact me if it, if it doesn't work out. So we have, that's how we would do it using a buildup factor. There is another way to do this problem that's going to lead to a very conservative result. 
and that is use the energy absorption coefficient. If we use the uh, energy absorption coefficient, uh, we can look up what the energy absorption coefficient is. We know what our um, uh, thickness of material is. Uh, then if we use the energy absorption coefficient, we would have a half of a millisievert per hour. So um, if we calculated it just the attenuation and no uh, um, buildup factor, we would have had a dose rate, just the e to the minus mu r, right? We would have uh, uh, a dose rate of 0.5 millisieverts, 0.05 millisieverts per hour. That was way too small. If we use the buildup factor, it would be, it, we figured out it was 0.32 millisieverts per hour, which is more realistic. So it's important to use the buildup factor because we would have underestimated what our dose is. Yes, John. What is the mu r? Is uh, that? That's mu. how far mu times the distance that is the thickness of material. Okay. Actually, I think this was, yeah, R was the, the radius of that pipe, the 30 centimeters radius of the pipe. Okay. And so, yeah. Um, so that's one kind of source. Another kind of source is a disk source, a plane source. Yes, John. Is your hand still up from before? Sorry, just didn't lower it. Oh, that's all good. Okay, so I'm going to do another uh, set up another problem. This is a disk source, and uh, for some reason I didn't do the derivation on the other one, but that's what I'm going to do now. This is not a problem you'll have to do. I'm just going to prove to you uh, do a derivation to tell you what the formula is if we have a disk source. So here, let's consider our source to be a ring of thickness dr, and the the, the ring has a radius of r. So what is the, the thickness of the, the, the material that's there? It's two pi times R is the, the length of this ring and DR is the thickness of the ring, right? So that's the surface area of the um, small ring, uh, just a typical ring. The distance away is, if we're gonna call the point we're interested in Z and the, the we said the radius that is R, then the distance is uh, squared is z squared plus r squared. So that's what any little differential line of source is. Now we add up all the little differential lines. So from r equals zero all the way out to r is equal to capital R, right? So we're, we've got the gamma source right here. One over r squared, how far we are uh, times, um, uh, yeah. So the, the the area of the whole thing is uh, the the area of this thing the, of the little ring divided by the area of the overall thing is two pi r dr over the pi r squared. So the activity is divided up into these little bitty rings divided by the area of the whole thing. That's the fraction of activity that's in the little bitty ring. Clear so far? We we um, add all these up by adding up the radius from zero out to r. And that turns out to be a logarithm if we do this, this uh, formula. So the dose rate due to a disk of radius r is our activity times the gamma factor times the natural log of z squared, or divided by r squared, the natural log of z squared, how far away we are, plus r squared, the radius of the ring, divided by z squared. This turns out to be the formula that you use if you've got a plane disk source. A plane meaning flat, not plane meaning ordinary. So a flat disk source, um, this would be the, the formula that you would get as a result of that. Um, what's an application you could use this for? Um, these This kind of thing would be, is common, it, I don't know, it has been used in situations like what let's suppose there's a dirty bomb that goes off and there's it was a you know uh 10 curie source and it's spread out over uh you know a certain area what will the dose rate be to people who have to walk in that area and so this is the kind of calculation you can do to get the dose rate from a, a flat plane covered with radioactive material 
Does that make sense? So I just want to make you familiar with this formula. It's it's not a calculation that we I've done often. We don't usually deal with plain sources, but that's an example that you might see at some point in your career. So in the course, you should be made aware that this formula exists and it's out there. There's another one that may exist that's used more frequently. And that's the instead of a disc, let's say we have a hockey puck. And in addition to material being in the hockey puck, there's attenuation as the material goes passes through the hockey puck. So this is a tank of water containing radioactive material with some concentration of radioactive material. What will the dose rate be at some distance above that uh, uh, tank of water? Same kind of thing. You, you do it by a little bit of calculus. You have e to the minus mu r. You have a bunch of disk sources, right? Each layer in this tank of water is a disk source that we just solved right here. So we have those disk sources. And in addition to the disk source, we have um, attenuation that occurs because of the material it has to pass through to get to our, um, our point, right? So we add up all the attenuation factors uh, that's sort of separate from the dose due to each disc. And then we find out that the dose is just like an individual disc source uh, times one minus e to the minus mu t. Okay, uh, it does have a factor of t, which is the thickness of the tank, the height of the tank, the depth of the tank. This is another formula that you might see in some situation. Um, it, it would it, it would make sense to use, for example, above a, a swimming pool type reactor, where you have a, a depth of water and you have a certain concentration throughout the, through the water of some contaminant, maybe cobalt sixty or a, um, and, and anyway, you can figure out what the dose rate would be from that. Another kind of shielding problem that comes up is from immersion in a cloud of radioactive gas. So in this case, we're looking for what is the dose rate at the center of this cloud? And we're gonna cons uh, consider each little shell that's half of a, a sphere and add up all of the attenuation, or add up for, for that, figure out what the attenuation back to the center is and add up, add these up for all of the such little shells it turns out the dose rate in this case is the gamma factor times the concentration times two pi divided by mu. As the sphere, we, we count all the spheres out to infinity. So this is the dose rate due to a semi-infinite cloud. That does become important um, in uh, power plant situations where you sometimes have noble gases that may be present in a, in a large area, like a containment uh, vessel. Okay, so those are the situations, the, the shielding situations that we can we might face. Um, I didn't do a lot of example problems. I'm going to do some example problems and record them and make them available to you on uh, Panopto. And uh, uh, first, I want to get your homework graded. Uh, I'm sure you're anxious to see that too. So do I have any questions about the, the, the different ty types of, of shielding problems we face? Dr. Cher? Yes. When um, you're doing like in the hockey puck scenario. Yes. What constant represented like the thickness of the source or do we just assume like yeah, infinitely thin it's right t the uppercase t yeah all right that's how deep the tank is or the thickness of the the um you know material okay okay and i think that the the uh, no, i'm not think i'm sure these are also worked out in the Staven book that I made available to you. And so that's a good resource as well, where he uh, goes through all this. I think, let me look at it, I had it open earlier today. 
Yeah, chapter nine. Looks like he has the point source, the line source, the plane source, volume source. Okay, I'm going to share this. I'll move it over here. I did a hockey puck. He did it with a, uh, a a taller cylinder than me. Okay. Same same solution. He uses the symbol CV, which is the, the volume concentration, or um, CA is the area concentration. I uh, when I did them, I just uh, left it in with all this the gamma factor and the activity all in here. You know what I'm saying? I didn't I didn't use that symbol, but you know, pi r squared t is the volume. So this would be the con the volume concentration, activity divided by volume. So that's how you can compare mine to his. Okay, so, next question. Yes, ma'am. The writing says thickness, lowercase t. So is the uppercase t the volume then? The, the, uh, that should be an uppercase t. It's a cylinder of total thickness t. The little t is supposed to be a constant. Okay. That that I mean a constant. It's supposed to be a variable. So we okay. add up however depth it is from zero up to okay. capital T, the total thickness. That's it's a capital T of multiple little t's. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then yeah. Uh, so this is showing a dose rate above the disk. But what about on the side of a cylinder, like when you? Have I don't think they. I don't think they've got that problem done. Right. Uh, oh. The Navy has a shorthand for side of the poly bottles. Well, would, would it be like a line source then? Um, no. It, there is a different formula? For poly bottles, um, as long as it's even. Great. I'll have to look it up. I'll have to look, or you can just send me the, or you I, can tell us if you I like. Don't, I don't have it in my head anymore. And okay. I don't. I, I'm not familiar with that solution. Let's see if uh, our good friend. I think it might be also just an experience, is, like. These are idealized situations, right? We use them when we can. No, he doesn't. But I feel like we had a like at a third at a certain percentage of the height, or like at halfway, you would expect a certain amount. Yeah. It they had so something. That may have come from experience. It, it may be it, they might have. Uh, there might be somebody who did this calculation, but probably it's measured. That it sounds like something might be measured because yeah. you don't have a um, uh, symmetry that makes the problem easy. Well, you, the assumption was that everything is evenly distributed throughout, because if it's sunk to the bottom, which is what happens, then right. that goes out the window. Then, yeah. then it would be different, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you want to share that with us, I think everyone would be grateful. Um, other questions? So I'm going to do some problems to show you. I, I don't think we, we do. I, I don't think that we have done enough example calculations for people. Now we're getting into these practical things. I think I should do more of that. I just didn't have it ready for today, but I'll I'll record some of that so you'll you'll be able to see those. Okay. I feel like like the majority of the time practically I'll either code for it or I just measure it. <laughs> like I never calculate. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Another thing people do a lot is use um uh point kernel codes like um microshield to model these things. It basically does the the um, e to the minus mu x and includes buildup factor for you. It does all that for you, basically. But it's not perfect. You're right. You're right. It's still modeling software, but yep. it, gets you, it gets you close, right? Yes, it does. It, it gets you in the ballpark, and then you have to use a little bit of judgment. Yep. And like you said, we, we often just throw a safety factor in just in case because it yeah. doesn't cost that much more to add another inch of concrete or whatever. Well, it can cost that much more to add an extra inch of lead. <laughs> well, lead might be expensive. <laughs> well, yeah. But again, then again, if, you, if you're a profitable company, they don't even notice. Well, but there, be, there, you actually can run into structural issues. Oh, yeah, that's true. Fine. That's uh, true. Yeah, I mean, we have hot cells that are many tens of thousands of tons. So. Oh, my. Yeah, so there there is a point of diminishing return, actually. Yep, that's why it's Alara, right? Not yeah. a weekly lap. You got to find out what makes sense. Other questions, other comments? Well, thank you for taking time to, to sit in with us and uh, have a good week. Uh, good. Well, it's almost the weekend, so have a good weekend. I will get your um, 
uh, test back to you as soon as possible. I haven't been uh, able to do yet. Yes, sir. Dr. Sure. I had a question about um, uh, like advising and yep. uh, like, are you still like the main contact for advising for the? I'm the only guy you've got. I'm okay, sorry. great. I, okay, so you want me to, I'm going to stop the recording now uh, and we can talk about advisors. I know. Mean, is it a general question that everyone else who's not here might be interested in? We can talk about that. Is well, I was going to, mm -hmm. the um, the lab, the instrumentation yep. lab yep. over the summer, The yep. I don't think the dates are posted for when, because that's they just are, like a week-long lab, right? I will, I will show you. I'll show okay. everybody else right now uh, where, how to find that out. Um, let's use this one. Yes, there are summer classes other than the lab, at least on There's the one, one summer class in health physics. Mm -hmm. And there are, the, of course, the other ones that we do. Um, let's see. So let's go to, uh, let's open a new window. You all got this now, right? This is not something that's surprising to you to see the access ITT. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, we're going to go to Banner. That's where you register, all right? And I'm not a student, so I have to go through other routes to get there. I'm going to go to the course uh, schedule, class schedule. We're going to choose summer. This is all familiar to you guys? If not, you're getting less. So we're going to physics courses. I'm going to put, pick in particular 550. That's the lab course. Just to go there first. And here are the schedules. Now, the dates for the first session are June 5th through June 9th. And so those are the class times on all those days uh, during that, that range. That's what where you will be on campus during those time periods. Um, you know where the lab is located i think it's got a room number on here right uh the second week is june 12 through 16. you got a class at 8 to 9 30 you have another class 1 to 2 30 and then you go off and do the counting labs and is that just the lab is there any coursework like throughout the summer or is it yep. just that okay nope. there, there is also a, a blackboard type course it goes with it. This is just the time you're there to gather your, to collect your data and to physically touch them the instruments. Okay, so we do actually have, there is classes outside of that week then. There are other assignments. Yeah. I don't think that there are, I've never taken it, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that there are other meeting times mm -hmm. outside of that, but I think there are other modules you have to do in addition to the time that you're present. Okay. You, you know, um, right, all, writing up all the labs, for example, and answering questions about the instruments and all that. Um, okay. Did that help? Uh, oh, the question is what else is available in the summer? And the only other class, and well, the, there are classes like the Sci 511, Sci 522, um, you know, those. Um, uh, professional development type courses, and then the other physics class that you that is available. I don't remember the number, it's, even though I teach it. It <laughs> is. I don't remember the numbers for everything. So it is. I think it's operational health physics. That's it, and the number is uh, five seventy seven. And there are a few people signed up already. Seven. Signed up now. Oh, oh we can sign up already. Pardon me. Can we? I, I didn't realize we could sign up already for classes. That was going to be my question when we can start talking. I think, I think you can start signing up for fall classes already. Oh wow! I'm pretty sure people are now. Uh, like a week ago, people started signing up for fall classes. At least I started getting emails about a week ago. Um, oh my God, Sonia, we're behind. We're behind. <laughs> that's okay. You know, um, let's go look at fall. Yes. Just, Okay, I'm going to stop the recording because we've seen enough. Of, I think the the, the uh, our guests have seen it out of the guess isn't the right word, but the general answers have been answered. <laughs> yeah, um, then I'm going to um, uh, so let me do.
go back and so let's stop the recording uh thank you all for your attention and the, 